You may remain standing for the entire service. Some of you have never been happy to find your seat. I know. Hamstrings popped during that worship session. You know, the week starts for me on a Friday morning after I get done Thursday night preaching out of the book of Daniel where the Lord has us currently. And it's amazing to see how I start with absolutely nothing on a piece of paper or a computer. And I, I honestly am like, Lord, what do you have for your people? Where are we going with this? I read the text over and over, and it's amazing week after week how he puts together the messages that come forth from this podium and this platform. By his grace alone, it has been an honor to look at the book of Daniel and then see the times that we are currently living in. Remarkably, we went through several, several chapters that dealt with prophetic vision, and those prophetic visions, they actually traced the ages from Daniel's time in Babylon, this is where those visions began, and they run all the way through our present day into the end times scenario, where Christ comes again and he exacts justice once and for all. Every wrong will be made right. So that is where the world is headed the world that is in opposition to Christ under the influence of the spirit of Antichrist, the Antichrist does two things. The spirit, it either seeks to oppose the things of God, outright persecution, opposition, or it seeks to counterfeit and replace the things of God, false religion. And that is why the Christian must know the difference we must have a handle on the scriptures to rightly divide the word of truth, to know that as the world is heading towards destruction, it is the church who is supposed to stand in the gap and cry out like John the Baptist in the wilderness, preaching, teaching, and living the gospel because that is the only hope that this world has. Do you believe that, church? Now, as the world is spinning in that direction, did you know that our current culture, our current country is also moving in an unbiblical direction? And what is happening is not just social. Did you know that? It's not just political. In fact, first and foremost, it's spiritual. You cannot violate the laws of God in every area of life and not have consequences. There are consequences for breaking Divine law. Remember, if divine order does not determine human order, the result is disorder. Or rebellion against God's order always leads to ruin. The spiritual walls of our country are currently laying in ruins. What's it going to take to turn it around? Not social reform. That won't do it. Not a political revote. That's not going to do it. The only thing that will turn our country around is if we spiritually repent. The Bible says if we repent, God will relent. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 7 through 10. Listen to this. This is the word of the Lord proclaimed. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build up and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit. Are you seeing both sides of this equation, I believe that latter part of what I just read is the United States of America. In so many terms, God shed his grace on thee. We have been favored the past two centuries. And the moment we turn away from divine law, divine order, we turn our back on God. It says, according to this text, that he takes his hand of favor off a country. The very country that he plants and seeks to build up for his glory because every nation embedded in every nation by divine design is the calling to glorify its creator. Every nation will stand to account before their creator. 
But I believe we're now on that first part of the text. Read it. It says the moment God decides to pull down, to pluck up, to destroy a nation or a kingdom, this is what I'm asking the church to do. If the people turn from their evil, if the people repent, in a word, change their mind about the direction that we're going, come back to God's mind, it says he relents. I am convinced that there is still a window if the church wakes up and repents of our wickedness, of our sinfulness, that we would be the ones that stand in the gap because this is exactly what Daniel did in chapter nine. This is what we're covering, right? Because we're in a spiritual battle and in a spiritual battle, you need spiritual weapons. With spiritual problems, you need spiritual solutions. And the church is the only entity, organism, globally speaking, that has the answer to the world's conflict and crisis. Remember, as Daniel, it says in the first few verses of chapter 9, as he was reading the books, as he was scrolling through the scriptures, as he was reading the prophet Jeremiah's scroll, he saw something, a number that was determined or appointed on the captivity of the Jews in Babylon. Now, mind you, he just witnessed Babylon fall. The very year that he pens chapter 9, Babylon has just been swallowed by the Medo-Persian Empire. There is a new government, a new sheriff is now ruling the known world. And Daniel begins to connect the prophetic dots. He starts to consider his history. Perhaps he did the math. He was 15 years old, many Bible scholars believe, when he was taken as a exile to the land of Babylon. Now he's in his 80s. It is perhaps the 67th, maybe the 68th year of their captivity. He sees the number 70 in the book of Jeremiah. He starts to count he begins to realize something's about to happen because God said, after 70 years, I'm going to set them free, put them back in their land, allow them to rebuild their temple, and of course, start over again because my mercies are new. I'll put my hand of favor on you all over again because he's a merciful God. Notice what Daniel does. He doesn't go, okay, God's will be done. Now I can sit back and coast off into retirement. No, that's not what he does. He doesn't say God's will be done and then use that mantra as an excuse not to do God's will. He prays. And prayer is a way of aligning your life with God's life. Prayer is a way to exchange your will for God's will. I don't want my will to be done. That is a very dangerous proposition. My will and way got me into trouble. My will and way imposed causes harm and damage and division. So I pray and I say, not my will, God. Your will be done. But notice this powerful prayer, which I've entitled a broken prayer for a broken people. Guess where it was generated from? The word. So to reiterate the major points from last Thursday, prayer is generated by the word of God. If you're not reading the word of God, you will not have the vocabulary or the language of heaven to even communicate with heaven's economy. God will respond to his word. So here's what moves heaven, not the verbiage of my word, but the usage of God's word. When I supply heaven's word back to heaven, oh, you better believe God is going to respond to his word. He's going to respond to his promises. Prayer is also grounded by the will of God. I'd rather have the will of God than my own will. Listen, if all the saints through all the ages were praying for one thing and it was not in God's will, that would not change it because God's will is going to be done. So I want to look into God's will. And here we have access to the entire will of God, right? This is the Old and New Testament, Genesis to Revelation, 66 books in one. It is actually the last will and testament of a dying man. But that dying man got up three days later, and he left us 
with access to his will. Prayer generated by the word of God. Prayer grounded by the will of God. Prayer germinated by the work of God. Only by the work of God will he birth within a man or a woman who is serious about being about his business, a zeal for his house, a passion for his economy. This is why Daniel prayed a broken prayer on behalf of a broken people. As we get deeper into the chapter, what we're going to discover is he wasn't just using the prophet Jeremiah and the scroll that predicted the outcome of the 70 years. He also was using the law of Moses. His, his prayer was framed by a knowledge of the law of Moses, because how can you claim that you broke a law that you don't know? And he's claiming that, God, we broke your law because in your word, you've told us what your law was, and you said that blessings come by obeying your law. And guess what? Curses come by disobeying your law. Where did he read that? Every Jewish boy, they knew Deuteronomy 28. The chapter in and of itself is extensive. The entire chapter is divided into two parts. The first part, explicit in nature, dealing with the blessings that God gives, magnificent blessings for anyone who obeys his law. Read through it. It's remarkable. He will bless you. He will protect you. He will provide for you if you obey my law. The second part of the chapter deals with the consequences or the curse of disobeying his law, disregarding his law. It's reiterated in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 40 to 42. It's a summary representation of the law of Moses or the Ten Commandments, and it's expounded upon in Leviticus 26. And here's what happens. If the people were to break God's law, God was giving them a way out to own their consequences and then come back to him in a word, ready? Repentance. It means to change your mind. Homo logio, which means to say the same thing as God. Homo logio, homo same, logio word. Say the same thing as God, to confess what you've done against God, to agree with God. Daniel is agreeing with God. In Leviticus, he would have understood these were the terms. You ready? But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, God says, and that they also have walked contrary to me and that I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham, I will remember, I will remember the land. This is what Daniel knew. Every Jewish boy who knew the scriptures understood the blessings and the curses of God. Daniel knew as he read, we are sitting in captivity as a result of our doing. Guess who else understood that hundreds of years later? So you got the law of Moses, then you got the line of kings all the way through to David. David has a son named Solomon. Solomon was blessed with the opportunity to build the first temple, a structure where God's presence could be with his people in the center of Israel, Jerusalem, and he dedicates the temple and the altar with this magnificent prayer. And guess what he quotes from? Deuteronomy chapter 28, Leviticus chapter 26. And he says this, when they talking about the people, talking about his people, when they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and deliver them to the enemy. Over and over, this language is used in the scriptures. When the people of God disobey God, he gives them over to something. In this context, he gave them over to their enemies. He says this, and they take them captive to the land of the enemy far or near. Yet when they come to themselves in the land where they were carried captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of those who took them away, saying, we have sinned and done wrong. We have committed wickedness. And when they turn to you with all their heart, with all their soul in the land of their enemies who led them away captive and pray to you toward their land, which you gave to their fathers, the city which you have chosen, the temple which you have built for your name, then hear from heaven, heal and forgive. And he keeps praying that same exact rhythm. 
What's the point? The point is, when you break the laws of God, there are consequences. We know that in the natural, don't we? If you were to break the law of gravity, nobody in this room with a rational mind would try to say there's no consequences for breaking the law of gravity. You walk off a building, there are going to be grave consequences for that action. We all know that. We all know if we break the law of electricity, you will get burnt. We all know that. Nobody's going to argue that. But some reason, we don't think that when we sin against God, when we break his divine law, that there's no consequences. And we often use Jesus, who, yes, paid our sin debt in full, but there are still consequences for transgressing against the law of God. Over and over, we see God giving people over to their sin, giving them over to judgment, giving the Israelites over to their enemies. Now, we might be far off from that, being taken captive by a physical enemy, but are you seeing that we have been taken captive by a spiritual enemy? Are you even recognizing We don't have to be taken to a foreign land to be taken captive by a spiritual enemy. He has taken this land captive with his lies and his false ideology. And what I want to say to this assembly is our land has been taken captive by groupthink and will only be set free by returning to how God thinks. Do you know what groupthink is? Groupthink is a psychological phenomenon that occurs within a group of people in which the desire for harmony or conformity in the group results in irrational or dysfunctional decision-making outcome. The problematic or premature consensus that is characteristic of groupthink may be fueled by a particular agenda, or it may be due to group members valuing harmony or coherence above critical thought. Groupthink is when the majority just goes with the flow without asking questions. Groupthink in America, which is a stronghold, ideologically speaking, philosophically speaking, that has a grip on minds in America, and I know it's a spiritual enemy who blinds the eyes, he deceives the masses. The first form of groupthink that is causing damage to the church of Jesus Christ, and we need to combat it by knowing the truth, is social justice. Or should I say woke justice? I don't have to give you any color commentary. I can give you one summary statement. If you don't know what social justice is, it is antithetical to biblical justice. Social justice can be summarized by a biblical illustration of the crowd choosing Barabbas over Jesus. Need I say more? They chose a criminal over the Savior. The second form of groupthink that is sweeping across our land First being social justice or woke justice. The second, pseudoscience. Trust the science. Trust the science, unless that science is biology that determines there are only two genders, male and female. Don't trust that science. Trust your feelings. Trust the science, unless that science is physiology, which says it is a life within the womb upon conception. It is a baby. It's not a fetus. It's not a clump of cells. Trust the science unless it contradicts the narrative. Trust the science unless it's the science of geology, which is the study of creation and earth which embedded throughout all creation is divine design that points to an intelligent creator. And that's why they are shoving down our students' throats this this pseudoscience, which is more like science fiction of evolution, as opposed to teaching the proper science behind a creator and there's perfect design in everything we see. And we wonder why there is no life that is being valued today. Well, if you're teaching me that I came from nothing and I'm going to nothing, then what do I have? It's called groupthink and people just go with the major consensus. The third groupthink 
which I am going to labor to bring into the church because I believe it's this very one that has gotten us into this current critical condition. The first is social justice. The second is pseudoscience. The third group think is governmental compliance. Government says, don't pray. Daniel 6. Government says, you can't worship and praise. Daniel 3. Government says you can't preach the truth, Acts chapter 4. Government says you can't gather because the church is non-essential, 2021. See, governmental compliance, when the government, which has been the long arm of the enemy throughout the ages, do you understand it has been government that has unleashed the greatest persecution against the church of Jesus Christ. That's the only stream that he swims in to accomplish his wicked agenda. If he can get a people to be disarmed of truth, he can swoop in and he can completely accomplish his wicked agenda and we just go with the flow. And the church has said, separation of church and state, we're just going to stay in our lane. And we have erred greatly because separation of church and state always rolls over to submission of church to state. In 1933, the very year that Hitler, behind the scenes in Germany, the Nazi movement was brewing. He was like a master chess player. He was setting the board up. And all across the land, as they were championing this new form of government, eventually the German parliament dissolved and in swooped Adolf Hitler. And would you know that the pulpits in that land during that time for the next several years, many of which preached out of Romans chapter 13, which is the chapter that deals with government and structure, which says the government is a divine appointment by God. He puts the government in its place to accomplish two things. The first, to punish wicked and evil, to honor good, to promote civil service that's honorable. But the moment government forfeits that divine appointment and they no longer punish evil and honor good, in fact, they do what Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 says, woe to those that call evil good and those that call good evil. The moment government now honors evil and disciplines or criminalizes good, they forfeited their authority. And there is coming a day, whether you see it or not, I see it with crystal clear clarity. I can, I can sense it in the spiritual realm. There's coming a day, and the church and the Christian are the target. Are you seeing this? Several years later, after many of those pulpits preached out of Romans 13, inviting their worshipers and their congregants to submit to government. Don't get involved. Let them do their thing. We stay in here. Many years later, six million Jews were slaughtered. And you know what they used? They didn't have this tool back then. They had tools that they deployed called propaganda, and they got all the people, groupthink, to think that the Jews were a threat to public health. <laughs> the Jews were a threat to national security. The Jews, because of their race, when you weaponize race and people don't look into what is being propagated, propaganda, and do their own research and have a biblical worldview which sees what's happening, I'll tell you what happens. You ready? Group think precedes the gas tank. It's exactly what happened. Six million Jews slaughtered. So what are we to do? We are to do what the Bible says we are to do. Paul would write to the church at Corinth in the second epistle, chapter 10, verses three to five, he would say, Yes, we walk in the flesh, but we don't war in the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God, ready, for pulling down strongholds. A stronghold, a fortress, is an ideology or a false doctrine that has a strong hold on a community, on a family, on a country. He says, pull them down. How do you pull them down? You lift up truth. 
Cast down arguments, conversations that are built on lies. Cast them down with truth. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Well, how do you do that? I'll tell you, you captivate your thoughts and your mind with the word of God. If you don't spend time captivating your thoughts and your mind in the word of God, you will be taken captive by the lies of the enemy. And lies thrive in the mind when truth is denied. Lies thrive in the mind when truth is denied. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, globally, nationally, the church and the Christian is supposed to lift up the gospel, lift up the truth. Part of that needs a people to return to how God thinks. That's it. That's the word repentance. To return to how God thinks. And when we return to how God thinks, the first thing that we do is we declare who God is. This is how Daniel started the prayer. He says in verse four, and I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God. All right, stop, because I couldn't get past some of these original Hebrew words. They are worth discussing. The first that we're going to pull out of the text is the word prayed. It's the word palau. It actually means interpose or intermediate or intervene or to be the one that goes between. So he's going between the people, his people, and he's going to God. And what he's going to do, he's going to bring the needs of the people to the only one who can handle those needs, the only one who has the authority to deal with the people. He says, Palau, which is a reminder, ready? One of Daniel's contemporaries was another prophet named Ezekiel. Did you know that when Ezekiel was in his ministry, Daniel was in the palace, right? Daniel was being used in the kingdom. Ezekiel was on, proverbial speaking, on the other side of the wall. So God placed two of his prophets, one in the palace and one with the common people. And both of them were doing the work of God. Nobody knows whether or not they knew each other. But right before God would allow the third siege with Babylon taking over Jerusalem and Judah and destroying the temple, right before the third siege, they're already in captivity. God said this to Ezekiel. I sought for a man among them who would build a wall, who would be a wall, who would, ready? Who would stand in the gap. That's where we get that phrase. Who would stand in the gap on behalf of the people and the land so that I wouldn't destroy them, God said. But I found no one. You know what I find fascinating about that? Is several decades later, you have Daniel who is raising his hand and going, I'll stand in the gap. Daniel chapter 9 is Daniel the prophet standing in the gap as the walls laid in ruin. He says, I'll stand in the gap and I am willing to broach the breach. How many of us are at least willing to broach the breaches, talk about the breakdowns? And when we are willing to engage the breakdowns, the next thing you do after you broach a breach, a breakdown in a marriage, a breakdown in a family, a breakdown relationally, breakdown in your soul, when you are willing to broach, get real with it, the breach, the next thing you do is you beseech the Lord on behalf of the breach. And that's what intercessory prayer is built upon. This is what Daniel's doing. He's saying, let me stand in the gap. We are a broken people, and I'm going to offer up a broken prayer. Palau. He then calls out to the Lord my God. Interestingly, if you have your Bibles and you're looking at it, the very first mention of the word Lord, it should be capitalized. And anytime you see Lord capitalized in your Bible, it is expressing Yahweh. Yahweh was the inexpressible name of God. In fact, the Jews would not even utter that name. So they decided to change the name to Jehovah. It means the same. It means self-revealing God, self-existing God. Remember when Moses was called by God and he was going to go tell the people that God had a plan and he was going to go confront Pharaoh. Moses is like, wait a second, I got to talk on your behalf. Who do I say sent me? And God said, you tell them, I am who I am. You know what that means? 
I am who I've always been, and I will be who I am right now. I am the never-changing God. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is God who was, who is, and who is to come. This is Jehovah. There are so many ways to describe this God of ours, this Yahweh, this Jehovah God. But in Proverbs 18, verse 10, it says, the name of the Lord, Jehovah, is a, ready? Strong tower. And the righteous run to it and are safe. When the walls of the city, spiritually speaking, are broken down, do you, do you run to the one who can build them up, who is the strong tower? He chooses the phrase God, my God, which is Elohim. Elohim is mentioned for the first time in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God, there you go, Bible 101. In the beginning, Elohim, which expresses the plural of majesty. Right there, before you even get anywhere in the Bible, that word Elohim expresses, ready? Trinity. The pluralness of God. So if any critic says God is singular, you remind them Elohim is plural. It's already expressing perfect community embedded into Elohim. He then says, and he makes confession, it's the word yada, yada. He says, Palau to Jehovah Elohim, and he makes yada. What is yada? It's the same idea of confession. It means to say the same thing as God, to agree with what God says, to agree with who God is. And now he gets into the prayer. You ready? O Lord, he changes the word. It is not the first mention of Lord. It's now Adonai. He's like exhausting the names of God before he makes a single request. He is declaring who his God is. How about that, church? If we just spent time declaring who our God is, that will take care of all the other requests. You're the great supplier. I don't got to ask for a need when I tell him who he is. You're the great protector. I don't got to ask him to protect me when I just said he is. Adonai. Adonai means master. Adonai means, ready, owner. When you have a problem with a business, when you go to present that concern, who do you ask for? You ask for the owner. Why? Because the owner is the only one with the authority to deal with your concern. He's saying Adonai, and then he declares he is great and he is awesome. Now, interestingly, he is declaring that God is the owner of all of earth. You are the master of all of earth. That is a good place to start in your prayers. Oh God, oh Lord, you are sovereign. That's the word, right? Now he moves into great and awesome. The word great here means mighty and majestic. You are mighty and you are majestic. Some translations, which are actual better translations than this word because we've overused this word awesome. The proper translation is, oh great and terrible God. Dreadful God. Yes. Terrible. Why? Because it expresses a fear when you approach his holiness. Not this haphazard approach, Jesus is my buddy, you know, the, the, the country song Jesus who sits on the back of the tail bed and drinks a beer with you, cursing on a Saturday, churching on a Sunday. No, no, this is a holy God. This is a sovereign God, this is a holy God. Now, not to get lost in the details, Job, chapter one, chapter two, show us a window opened in heaven, Satan's attempt to destroy Job. God allows it because he was gonna turn the enemy's plot on him and eventually recycle what was done to cause harm and make good out of it because that's what God does. He is the owner, he is the master, he is sovereign. He can't be, he can't be plotted against. He can't be manipulated. He knows. Now, what happens is Job loses everything. And then for the next tons of chapters, chapter three, all the way to chapter 37, his friends show up. And they're having these profound conversations about why Job is going through what he's going through. Job's confused. Job is asking questions. They're accusing him. Perhaps he's got some un covered sin that he needs to confess. And that's probably why you're being punished like this. God is dealing with you. And Job's like, I don't think so. And he's wrestling through his grief and all of his friends are asking these questions. And it goes on for chapters. You got to read it. it. Just goes, keeps going on. Craziest thoughts. And then something happens. 
God shows up. In chapter 38, God says, who is this that darkens counsel with words that have no knowledge? Show yourself a man. I'll ask the questions. You do the answering. And then I'm going to paraphrase. You got to read it on your own time. God rattles off these rhetorical questions that are both mysterious and majestic. Where were you when I created this thing called planet Earth and this solar system and all of the universe? Where were you when I set the ordinances of the stars and the planets in the sky? Where were you when I embedded a coordination in creation and animals to know when to give birth, to know when to migrate south like birds? Where were you when I stored up all the snow in the heaven? Have you visited the place of death? Have you ever been to where light comes from? Do you know anything about darkness? And he rattles off all these profound questions. Why? Because he's put in little puny man, even, yes, Job, a blameless and righteous man in all the earth. God said that about him. And he's saying, who are you to question my judgments? That's a holy God. This was Job's response. Then Job answered the Lord and said, behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. Then God goes on all through chapter 40 and 41, asking these unbelievable questions again. And then Job finally speaks in chapter 42. And he says this, I have heard you by hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I abhor myself. This isn't a low self-esteem statement. This is a man saying, I am despised. Did you, hear what he, did you hear what he said? Church, I've heard of you. Now I see you. And too many Christians, they've only heard of God. They come Sunday after Sunday and they hear the sermons. They, they've heard of God, but they're never moved by God because they've never seen God. And the only way you can see God, according to Matthew chapter five, is blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And you can only have a pure heart if you've encountered the cross. Yeah. Job saw God. And when he saw God in his holiness, he admitted his vileness. In other words, to meet God in his holiness is to be overwhelmed by the discovery of our own sinfulness. Now, that's not an isolated circumstance. You see this over and over. Isaiah chapter six, verse five. Isaiah had just got done pronouncing woes on the various cities. And then chapter six, something happens. He sees the Lord high and lifted up and he sees his robe running through the temple. And he literally says to himself, woe is me. I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips who dwells in the midst of unclean lips people. I have seen the Lord God, the Lord of hosts, what happened? He saw God and the holiness drove him to recognize his own condition, right? Unclean lips, because out of the mouth speaketh the, the heart. Ezekiel chapter one, same thing. The end of chapter 21, or excuse me, chapter one, he sees God and he falls flat on his face. He falls flat on his face. Now you go, that's just the Old Testament God. And I go, Revelations chapter one, verse 17, John the Revelator sees Jesus, the majestic Jesus, and it tells us he falls flat on his face. Not backwards, out of control, not slain in the spirit, forward, surrender in total awe and completely broken in front of a holy God. And it was Jesus with his right hand that lifted him back up. Peter saw the glory of Jesus revealed in a miracle with the multiplication of fish after a long night of catching nothing. And Jesus says, cast your net over there. And they take in a huge catch. And Peter sees this. He recognizes this man that he called master, teacher, rabbi. And he says, Lord, depart from me. I am a sinner. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to come to terms with the fact that our God is holy. Holy. He is sovereign. He is holy. We are sinners. But that's a transcendent God. He doesn't stay transcendent. God above us. He becomes imminent. The word imminent here is I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T. If you want to know what it means, consider the word 
Emmanuel. Emmanuel ending with L, which means God. Eman, which means with, God with us. So the word imminent means to be with, to be pervasive, to be inherently in. So we serve a God who is remarkably transcendent, above and beyond, and yet divinely condescends and is imminent and he's with. And for the Christian, he deposits his presence within us. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And this is the next thing that Daniel claims, right? Oh Lord, great and awesome God, ready? Who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. This is an intimate God. This is a promise keeper. God has a covenant and he says, I'm gonna keep it. God has mercy and he says, I'm gonna give it. But with those who, ready? Who love him and keep his commandments. Jesus said the same thing in chapter 14, verse 15 of the gospel of John. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The disciple John in his first epistle, chapter five, verse three, he said this, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Right, in case you feel like you're being weighed down by following God, that's not God. The commandments of God are liberating. Jesus said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and do what? You'll find rest because you link up with me. You take my yoke upon you, my harness, my teachings, my presence. You link up with me, you go the way of grace, and my yoke, which is custom fitted for your shoulders, it's not going to be burdensome. In fact, it's the opposite. It's, it's light. My burden is light, he says. So God is like, if you follow me and you have an intimate relationship with me, I'm not a taskmaster. In fact, I'm a way maker. I'm a miracle worker. I'm a promise keeper. That is who I am. I am who I am. And I'll add to that, he is a mercy giver. This is exactly what Daniel is claiming. We jump ahead to verse 9 in Daniel 9, verse 9. He says it again, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. Right? He's, he's tugging at the heart of God, being merciful, being forgiven. Jeremiah the prophet would write this most amazing diary in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. He said, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not, his love and kindness cannot fail. You will fail, I will fail, we will fail. God's mercy never fails. In fact, it's new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Anybody need a fresh batch of mercy this morning? Anybody feel like a failure last night, but when you woke up, there was a new mercy for you, a new fresh forgiveness. This is what Daniel is claiming. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 18, again, he says, oh my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name, for we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds. This is key. We're not presenting anything before you because of our righteousness. We have none. We are presenting them to you because of your great mercies. Church and Christian, we have nothing to claim in the presence of God. Not good deeds, not our own merit, not our resume, not our family heritage, not our bank accounts, not our good name in the community. And I would even go the opposite way and say, you're bad, your failures, your mistakes, your sin, not even that can keep you from God. Your good can't get you to God. Your bad can't keep you from God. What are we left with? We are left with our only merit is claiming his mercy. That's it. This is proper prayer. The only merit that I hold before God, which is nothing, is his mercy. I claim his mercy. Remember, Jesus tells a parable, and it's in Luke chapter 18. It's a remarkable parable that highlights two different presentations of prayer. 
Now watch what happens in Luke chapter 18, verse 9. He spoke this parable, so it's a story that has a lesson attached to it. He spoke this parable to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So the audience are those who trust in themselves. They trust their good works. They have their resume all buttoned up. They think that they're good before God. They're a good person because they're not as bad as their neighbor. So they're good. They're in a good standing with God. And Jesus is like, I got a parable to tell you. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even this tax collector here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Did you hear how many times he said, I, I? And then Jesus telling a story. I love it because like, it's like uh, the camera pans. It, it leaves the temple section where people are flaunting their holiness, their own self-righteousness. And the camera pans and it stops and Jesus continues. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you this, Jesus says, that man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Did you hear his prayer? It's very simple. It's the gospel. God, mercy, me. God, holy, mercy, that's all I have. Sinner, me. God, propitiation, Sinner. God, atonement. Sinner. God, the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. Me. God, Jesus, me. That is the proper way to approach our Heavenly Father. This holy God, this sovereign God, this covenant-keeping God, this merciful God, this forgiven God. See, he forgives sin not because of any merit in the sinner. He forgives because of the infinite mercy of the Savior. Forgiveness comes to us because of God's mercy for his glory. John, in the first epistle that he wrote, chapter 2, verse 12, he said, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. It's for God's glory that he chooses to forgive. Now, let me bring you back to the text because you might be wondering, what is Daniel up to? First of all, the prayer is like a diamond. And all we're doing is we're turning the diamond and seeing different dimensions of the prayer. Last week, we looked at the first P, preparation, preparation of heart, anguish, brokenness. Tonight, we're looking at praise. He's declaring who God is. He is Adonai, he is Jehovah, he is Elohim, he is awesome, he is, he is terrible, he deserves fear and reverence, he's merciful, he's a covenant keeper. And then next time we're together, we'll turn the diamond again and we're going to look at the penance of the prayer, his confession, what he's claiming. But he's harmonizing with God's heart. He's harmonizing with his God's heart because he knows that's the only thing that'll move his God's hand. And whatever comes from God's hand is always right, is always righteous. This is the other thing Daniel holds on to in verse seven. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you. Hey, can I give you one sentence to summarize what he, he means when he says that? You are right, we are wrong. Case closed. You are right in how you deal with us and what you choose for us and what you've allowed to touch us. Let me say it again. You are right in how you choose to deal with us what you've allowed to touch us, you're right. You are righteous in your being. You are righteous in your doing. He says it again in verse 14. If you read through this prayer, therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does. Daniel's got no excuses. There's no justification. There's no complaining. He's saying we are in the very situation we are in. Our land lays in ruins. We are in the enemy's territory and it was right that you've allowed it. We deserved it. Psalm 145, verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. And again in verse 16, O Lord, according to all your 
righteousness, I pray. Let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. For your righteousness, according to your right deeds for us. Now, how do we reconcile this word righteousness, which is justice, really? Justice is you get what you deserve, right? But how do we reconcile the word righteous while at the same time plead for mercy, which is you get what you don't deserve? Well, in the word righteousness, God embedded mercy. But the righteousness that has mercy in it, it came to us in a person. It came to us in Jesus Christ, his son. How do you claim both? I'll never forget this because of what it meant. I stood before this judge on January 7th for the decision I made, which warranted a law being broken, which came with consequences. Because when you break a law, there are consequences. And I stood before a judge, and there were many people that spoke on my behalf as character references. My brothers, an alliance that I was working for, speaking into public schools and colleges that were speaking on my behalf. And then my father stood up. My father addressed the honor, your honor, a judge who deserves respect and in a way, a healthy fear, right? In his courtroom. My father explained who he was. I'm in law enforcement. I understand the need for justice. No excuses. My son broke the law. He is going to pay for his crime. Translation, it is right that he is here. But he said, Judge, I'm not coming to you as a police officer. I'm speaking as a father. And as a father, I'm asking you for mercy. My father understood righteousness while at the same time asked for mercy. And that was before a human judge and whether you realize this or not, one day you will stand before a holy judge, a heavenly judge. And on that day, it is going to be right that you are guilty. And the only thing you can claim on that day is mercy. And the mercy came to us in a person named Jesus. And the scales of divine justice can only be balanced out by Christ's righteousness. Is that not the pronouncement of judgment from Daniel chapter five? You have been weighed in the balance. You've been found wanting. He said that to a nation called Babylon. He said that to a king named Belshazzar. That echoes to everyone from every generation. You have been weighed in the balances and you have been found wanting. There's nothing you could present to me, God says. Unless... God himself paid for that sin debt, which righteousness demanded. And based on the sacrifice of Jesus, he left mercy for you to claim. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 21 says, for he who knew no sin became sin, that you might become the righteousness of God in him. That's individual. That is a free gift for anyone who wants to rise up and say, I need fresh mercy. It's right the way you've dealt with me, Lord, but I'm claiming your mercy. And as mercy falls upon individuals, I am convinced mercy can fall upon a nation yet again. And if the individuals who claim God's mercy understand what it means, the mercy that you know will be the mercy that you wanna show. So we would be those that stand in the gap for our broken land and the broken people around us. And we would intermediate for them before God. Because the Bible says righteousness exalts a nation and sin becomes a reproach to any people. Sin becomes a shame. See, it's time for the church to return to the Lord Time is running out, and I'm wondering what we are waiting for. And many of us need to wake up to righteousness. A 
God, forgive those Christians who are missing the writing on the wall because they are not reading the writings of your will. This God we serve, remarkable. He is Jehovah, Elohim, Adonai, covenant keeper, mercy giver. He is righteous in all his ways. And yet, though we deserve death, he decided to give us life in Christ. And that's the gospel. And I want to be like Paul and say, I'm unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto the salvation and salvaging of the soul. I claim that. It's mine. Oh God, do a work tonight as we praise you, as your word does what only your word can do. I pray we return to how you think and we would break the bonds of groupthink. Oh God, that in your presence of holiness, we would truly come undone. We would recognize we are sinners that are saved by your grace alone and we would rise up as sons and daughters of the one true King. All hail King Jesus. In the name of him who was and who is and who is to come. Amen.